Well, we're going to continue our study of the fear of the Lord this morning, and we're going to look at fear of man. Um, we've already mentioned that the fear of man is really the only corollary fear to the fear of God, the only fear that you can really put your finger on and say, now here's a fear that doesn't work like traditional fears. Um, it's a fear that actually drives you toward the object that you fear. And so, similar to the fear of God, the fear of man drives you to man. <laughs> fear of man it consumes the, the conscience with the desire to please and impress another human being. We're not created to fear men. We're created to fear God. And um, you already know that the fear of man is wicked. But nevertheless, I want to show you some texts that helpful, hopefully can help you in a, in a fresh way appreciate uh, what's so bad about the fear of man. You can just listen if you want. There's, I'm going to read through a list of passages just to kind of give you a, an appreciation for this. In Genesis 32, verse 11, Jacob says, Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him that he will come and attack me and the mothers with the children. So Jacob obviously feared his brother. He feared because it was a threat. He was afraid of what Esau could do to him and to his family. Numbers chapter 14, verse 9. Joshua and Caleb are speaking to the congregation. They say, Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not fear the people of the land, for they will be our prey. Their protection has been removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Obviously, the report was, this is an incredible land. It's, it's lavish. It's abundant. It's got everything we could possibly want. It's amazing that God is going to give us this land. The only problem is, there's some really, really big people there that we could not beat. Their military is better than our military. And so, you know how the congregation responded to that news. Joshua and Caleb alone were telling them, don't listen to that report. Don't let that deter you from obedience. Obey the Lord. Fear the Lord. But they feared Man, because they feared what man could do to them. Numbers 31, verse 34, But the Lord said to Moses, Do not fear him. And he's speaking of Og, king of Bashan, on their trip up to the promised land. Do not fear him, for I have given him into your hand and all his people and his land, and you shall do to him as you did to Sion, king of the Amorites, who lived at Heshbon. And so God just reminds Moses, Don't fear Og, king of Bashan. Don't fear man. Deuteronomy 117, Moses is describing, he says, uh, he's describing judgment among the people, uh, justice, really. You shall not show partiality in judgment. You shall hear the small and the great alike. You shall not fear man, for the judgment is God's. The case that is too hard for you, you shall bring it to me and I will hear it. Now, this is an interesting instance of the fear of man because unlike the other ones, the other ones are all about threats of what people can do to you by way of harm. This is an interesting one because it starts to expand our appreciation of fear of man because now it's in a context of a, of a, of a court uh, hearing and justice being distributed. And Moses is saying, do not show partiality. Don't favor the great or the small. Somebody who has resources or who does not have resources. Or somebody who could actually maybe hurt you or not hurt you. Or somebody who has influence that you want to impress or has no influence. Let justice be justice. And so now there's a fear of man of looking at the, the, a judgment given in a court context. Actually given for the purpose of impressing someone. Gaining their approval. That's a helpful addition to our, our quiver of fear of man passages. In Deuteronomy 1.21, um, Moses says, The Lord's told you the land's before you. Go up and take possession. Don't fear or be dismayed. So don't fear the people who live in the promised land. Deuteronomy 3.22 says the same thing. Don't fear them. The Lord your God is fighting for you. And there's several examples. and There's dozens and dozens of examples of that kind of fear of man in the scriptures. Uh, Joshua continues that same phrase. Uh, Joshua 8.1, do not fear or be dismayed. Talking about going up, God's given the, the people into your hands. Uh, same thing in J Joshua 10.8 and Joshua 14.8. Um, I want to skip up to 1 Samuel. 
There's, in the passage in 1 Samuel 15, it's a helpful passage about the fear of man. Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, and I have indeed transgressed the commandment of the Lord. Now in this context, we don't have time to develop this, but you remember this is Saul who was supposed to wipe out the Agagites and leave nothing alive. And Samuel said, I'm leaving, I'm going to come back in seven days. And Saul didn't see him on day seven, so he went ahead and offered a sacrifice as a priest, even though he was not a Levite. Samuel rebukes him, and he says, well, how, why didn't you obey the Lord? He's like, I have obeyed. <laughs> Claims his innocence. And here he says, I've sinned. And he explains why. In, verse, in chapter 15, verse 24, Saul explains why he sinned, why he compromised, and the cause was, you named it, fear of man. I have indeed transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, namely God's word through Samuel, because I feared the people and listened to their voice. He feared the people. Now this wasn't a fear like he was afraid of what they were going to do to him. He's the king. <laughs> he has all authority. He fears the people in the sense that he's concerned about what they think of him. And so he listened to their voice. And fear of man produces disobedience, transgression, and, of course, hypocrisy. Let's get forward to Proverbs 29, 25. This becomes a very important verse, and if we have time, we'll come back to this at the end. But Proverbs 29, 25, the fear of man brings a snare, but he who trusts the Lord will be exalted. The fear of man is so devastating. It brings a snare. And, and if, if I can put an image in your mind, I mean, the, the Hebrew here is literally sets a snare. So the image should be when you think about what it means to be concerned about what people think of you, that ideology sets a snare. It puts you in a trap. It catches you up. It's going to lock you up. And here's the way you, you should picture it. It prevents you from doing anything. It prevents you from being single-minded. It prevents you from being focused on the Lord. Because guess what? In a church of this size, how many targets are there to hit? I mean, if I'm going to fear man, and I'm going to be concerned about what people think of me, how many potential audiences are represented in a church of this size? How could you possibly know how to navigate any circumstance? I mean, just in this room alone. Think about trying to impress somebody in this context. Fear of man brings a snare. Nobody can possibly scratch all those itches and please all those audiences and meet all of those preferences and impress all of those persons. The fear of man sets a snare and it cripples you. It cripples you from pleasing the Lord. Isaiah warned the, the nation. He said, stop regarding man whose breath of life is in his nostrils. For why should he be esteemed? And I love the way he asked that question. Why should he be esteemed? You're talking about man whose breath of life is in his nostrils and even uses the terms that would have evoked how God created man in his image and then breathed life into him. So man is dust. The only reason that the dust in this room has life to it is because God breathed life into us. So why in the world would we fear man? Why should dust that has God-given breath in, it, in its nostrils be esteemed? God alone should be esteemed. Malachi 3.16 says this, Those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord gave attention and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who esteem his name. Now, watch what he does with this idea of the fear of the Lord. Verse 17, They will be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I prepare my own possession, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. So you will again distinguish between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. In a context where Malachi says that those who fear the Lord equal those who, who are written in the book of life. He goes on to expand that and then amplify that with a synonym to say, you've got two categories, the righteous and the wicked. 
Or you could say it's those who serve God and those who don't. If we think about fear of man and we boil it down to, we make it simpler or more compatible uh, or, or more, that's not the right word, but more comfortable for our conscience than it really is, we're, we're not going to call fear of man not serving God. We're not going to call it the idolatry that, that it ought to be. God-fearers, their names are written in the book of life. God-fearers are righteous. God-fearers serve God. Those who fear man, not written in the book of life. Those who fear man, wicked. Those who fear man, do not serve God. We cannot, we cannot start to become comfortable with the idea of fear of man and just say, yeah, you know, we talk to our, our friend over a cup of coffee. You know, I just, uh, just, you know, I struggle with fear of man sometimes. We should just be pulling out our hair. You do what? When you see fear of man in your own heart, you shouldn't say, oh, yeah, there it is again. Say, like, what is that? A crime against the God who created me, who created me and breathed life into me? The God who created me to fear him? What is this fear of man doing here? It must go. Well, those are just a few. I had a list of uh, passages in the New Testament as well, but... Um, we could keep reading. I think you, I don't think I have to convince anybody that fear of man is bad. I think uh, one of the most subtle forms of fear of man, particularly in the church, is not just the fear of man in general, but the fear of godly men. And so I titled this study this morning, Fearing the Best of Men is Fearing Man at Best. There's something subtle, there's something very tempting. There's something um, very easy to pull off, if you will, in the church named the fear of godly men. The fear of man produces compromise, disobedience, and hypocrisy, but especially the fear of godly man. We are given the perfect example of this in the tragic example of King Joash. I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles and open up to the book of 2 Chronicles, we're going to do a little bit of jumping around back and forth between 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles. We're going to spend most of our time in 2 Chronicles this morning. 2 Chronicles 22, verse 10, all the way through 24, verse 27, is the life of Joash. Joash was the son of Amaziah. His father was killed by Jehu, and his grandmother, Athaliah, set about to kill all of her grandsons through the line of Amaziah so that she would be the only, so that she would become royalty. And so she became Queen Athaliah, the only queen in the monarchy of the nation of Judah. In chapter 22 of Second Chronicles, verse 10, when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she rose and destroyed all the royal offspring of the house of Judah. And we've looked at this before, and I've mentioned this before. That is a, a, a very much typical of what ends up happening with Herod uh, and the Antichrist assault on all of the infants born in Bethlehem. Here is Athaliah. Uh, she's rejecting the Davidic covenant. She's trying to wipe out every seed in the line simply so she can become queen. And uh, this is just absolutely uh, idolatry and, and unbelief in, in, its, in its rankest form. But verse 11, it says, But Jehoshabeath, the king's daughter, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him from among the king's sons who were being put to death, and placed him and his nurse in the bedroom. So Jehoshabeath, the daughter of, the ki of King Jehoram, the wife of Jehoiada, the priest, for she was the sister of Ahaziah, hid him from Athaliah so that, she, so that he, she, would not be, she, she would not put him to death. He was hidden with him in the house of God six years while Athaliah reigned over the land. And then it goes on to say that he became king at the age of seven. So he was hidden in his first year as a baby as his own grandmother is running, uh, running around killing all in, in the royal line, all who would uh, have, have, a, have a line of the promise of, of David. Jehoiada is the high priest, and that becomes an imp 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 important figure here. Jehoiada is the high priest. He, ends up he and his wife end up basically raising uh, Jehoash, or Joash, depending on which account you're reading. It's the same name, same, different form of the same name. 
In fact, what's interesting is, I want to, I want to go back here uh, to 2 Kings for a moment and, and, and show you something that's pretty, pretty fascinating. And this does have a parallel uh, in both accounts. But look for a second at 2 Kings um, chapter 12. And look at verse 2. He, 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 the, 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 the author of Kings r- records the event of Athaliah back in chapter 11. And then it says in 12.1, in the seventh year, uh, he becomes king. In the seventh year of the king, he, he becomes king. Now, in verse 2, it be- this becomes the um, commentary on his rule. And, and the comment on a rule is, is absolutely common. You, you've read through the Kings, you've read through the Chronicles. You realize every time they introduce a new king, there's going to be a commentary, a brief commentary, on how they do. It's like a, it's like a, grade, a grade report, right? So here comes the grade report, the, the grade card. How, how did Joash do, or Jehoash in the Second Kings account? Jehoash did right in the sight of the Lord all his days in which Jehoiada the priest instructed him. That is absolutely an atypical summary of someone's reign. What's very common is a king who does poorly, it's going to just come out and say it. Chapter 13, verse 2, speaking of um, King Jehoash, um, I'm sorry, Jehoahaz. It says in verse 2, he did evil in the sight of the Lord and followed the sin of Jeroboam, which, uh, which he made Israel sin and he did not turn from them. That's a pretty simple, straightforward indictment. But what about a king who does well? Look at King Hezekiah in chapter 18. Chapter 18, it says of King Hezekiah in verse 3, he did right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father David had done. Now, this is interesting. Just a simple, he did well or he did evil. He walked in righteousness or he didn't. And and you you kind of expect that. Uh, But now, go back to 2 Kings chapter 12, verse 2. Jehoash did right in the sight of the Lord all his days in which Jehoiada, the priest, instructed him. He didn't do right all of his days. And he didn't do evil like the kings before him all of his days. He did right as long as Jehoiada was alive. Now, let's look over at 2 Chronicles. Let's go back to 2 Chronicles, chapter 24. Look at the similar phrase here in chapter 24, verse 2. 2 Chronicles 24, 2, Joash did what was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. Now, of course, the king's account includes all the days that Jehoiada instructed him. Uh, Obviously, that ended when he died. Um, Skip over to verses 15 to 19. Here's what happens at the end of uh, Jehoiada's life. So while Joash is still reigning, Jehoiada reaches a ripe old age and he died, verse 15. He was 130 years old at his death. Verse 16, they buried him in the city of David among the kings because he had done well in Israel and to God and his house. But after the death of Jehoiada, look at verse 17. The officials of Judah came and bowed down to the king and the king listened to them. They abandoned the house of the Lord the God of their fathers, and served the Asherim and the idols. So wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for this their guilt. Yet he sent prophets to them to bring them back to the Lord. Though they testified against them, they would not listen. It just falls apart. The wheels come off the bus of the appearance of godliness as far as Joash's reign is concerned as soon as Jehoiada dies. He can no longer keep up the ruse and... He is exposed. Well, let's look at this. Let's look at it a little closer and see, see what's going on here. Um, typically, if you read the story of Jehoash, uh, uh, you might think, man, something radically changed when Jehoiada died. But when you look closer, you realize, no, nothing really changed. He's still worshiping the same idol, and it just cha- it manifests itself differently when the circumstances change, and that's how it always goes. And so we learn a lot by paying attention to the example of Jehoiada and the example of of Joash. Let's go back and look at, first of all, we already looked at his childhood, but let's look at what happens with his relationship to Jehoiada. And as I mentioned, um, Jehoiada and his wife 
um, Jehoshabeat uh, raised him. And let's pick it up in 2 Chronicles 23, in verse 1. In the seventh year of Jehoiada, uh, in the seventh year, Jehoiada strengthened himself and took captains of hundreds, Azariah the son of Jer- Jerohom, Jer- <laughs> sorry, Jeroam, Ishmael the son of Jehon- Johanan, Azariah the son of Obed, Mas- Maasiah the son of Adiah, and Elishaphat the son of Zikri, and they entered into covenant with him. They go throughout Judah, they gather the Levites from all the cities of Judah and the heads of the fathers' households of Israel, and they come to Jerusalem. Verse 3, they, the, the whole assembly made a covenant with the king in the house of God. So you've got this national assembly. Jehoiada is at the front of it, and he's leading all of the nation into this commitment. Jehoiada says to them, Behold, the king's son shall reign as the Lord has spoken concerning the sons of David. This is the thing you shall do. One third of you, of the priests of the Levites, um, who come in on the Sabbath, shall be gatekeepers, and one-third shall be at the king's house, and a third at the gate of the foundation, and all the people shall be in the courts of the house of the Lord. But let no one enter the house of the Lord except the priests and the ministering Levites. They may enter, for they are holy, and let all the people keep the charge of the Lord. The Levites will surround the king, each man with his weapons in his hand, and whoever enters the house, let him be killed. Thus, be with the king when he comes in and when he goes out." He sets up a coup. This is a national level coup against Queen Athaliah, taking over the monarchy and restoring it back to God's design with a son of David at the throne. And so he strategically places a third of the Levites in strategic locations so that the king is always protected. And it's just absolute by sheer conviction and tenacity says this nation will follow Yahweh. It's a pretty bold move. Verse 8, Levites and all Judah did according to all Jehoiada the priest commanded. And each one one of them took his men who were to come in on the Sabbath with those who were to go out on the Sabbath, for Jehoiada the priest did not dismiss any of the divisions. So they would have normally switched roles and you you would have kind of gone off duty. Well, that Sabbath they all stayed on duty. Got 100% participation here from the Levites. Jehoiada the priest gave to the captains of the hundreds the spears and the large and small shields which had been King David's, which were in the house of God. He stationed all the people, each man with his weapons in his hand, from the right side of the house to the left side of the house, by the altar and by the house around the king. Then they brought out the king's son and put the crown on him and gave him the testimony and made him king. And Jehoiada and his sons anointed him and said, Long live the king! So at the end of verse 11, you have finally... Joash restored to the throne. You finally have a Davidic king reigning once again. This is all because of the conviction and the leadership and the obedience of Jehoiada. Athaliah is still alive. You've still got a queen who thinks she's the queen. Verse 12, when Athaliah heard the noise of the people running and praising the king, she came into the house of the Lord to the people. She looked, and behold, the king was standing by the, his pillar at the entrance, and the captains and the trumpeters were beside the king, and all the people of the land re- rejoiced and blew trumpets, the singers with their musical instruments, leading the praise. And then Athaliah tore her clothes and said, Treason! Treason! Jehoiada the priest brought out the captains of hundreds who were appointed over the army and said, Bring her out between the ranks, and whoever follows her, put to death with the sword. So anybody who's with Athaliah is about to be executed. And they drug her out because the priest had said, let her not be put to death in the house of the Lord. So verse 15, they seized her, and when she arrived at the entrance of the horse gate of the king's house, they put her to death there. Now pick it up with um, the national covenant. Then Jehoiada made a covenant between himself and all the people and the king that they would be the Lord's people. And all the people went out to the house of Baal and tore it down. They broke it in pieces. Uh, They broke in pieces his altar, uh, his altars and his images. And they killed Matan, the priest of Baal, before the altars. So they are just absolutely wrecking shop on idolatry. There is going to be no idolatry in this nation. We are devoted to, to Yahweh. Verse 18, moreover, Jehoiada placed officers of the house of the Lord under the authority of the Levitical priests, whom David had assigned over the house of the Lord, to offer the burnt offerings of the Lord, as it is written in the law of Moses, with rejoicing and singing according to the order of David. 
He stationed the gatekeepers of the house of the Lord so that no one who uh, would enter who was in any way unclean. He took the captains of hundreds, the nobles, the rulers of the people, and all the people of the land, and brought the king down from the house of the Lord, and came through the upper gate to the king's house, and they placed the king upon the royal throne. So all of the people of the land rejoiced, and the city was quiet, for they had put Athaliah to death with the sword. Now, some of those details might be lost on us, but you can just appreciate the detail of what it takes to perform a coup like this to restore Israel back to what was prescribed, to the level of detail of <clears throat> what God has prescribed as being clean and unclean, protecting the temple, establishing the safety of the king, and making sure that we are devoted to Yahweh, to the point of executing anyone who followed Baal or Athaliah. This is a zeal, an uncommon zeal, it could only be described as zeal that comes from the fear of the Lord. That's the inheritance that Joash had. That's the pattern that was set before him. That, for all intents and purposes, that was his earthly father. His dad obviously dying when he was an infant. And so here he is with the example of Jehoiada. How's he going to do? And that's why 24 verse 2 says, He did right in the eyes of the Lord. He did right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. As King says, as long as Jehoiada was instructing him. But we're going to learn a lot from this narrative about the fear of man, in particular the fear of godly men. One of the first important lessons about fearing godly men is we need to understand that if we fear godly men, we are fearing and worshiping someone who is flawed. 2 Chronicles 24, verse 3, says that Jehoiada took two wives for him, and he became the father of sons and daughters. Now, that's an explicit rejection of Deuteronomy 17. God told Moses that the king of Israel shall not multiply wives. He's to have one wife. Jehoiada gives his son two wives, and I'm calling him son for the sake of this story. You understand that he's the high priest and he is the son of Amaziah, but he's the father figure, and he gives him two wives. And it's interesting that he even records this, this flaw, this foible. And you think about it, if we fear godly men, suddenly we become, we, we inherit all of the flaws of that person. You can have no God but God. You should have no teacher but Jesus Christ. If we fear godly men, we have no more discernment, no more ability to scrutinize their shortcomings, their flaws. And we're going to follow them blindly, without discernment. But then as we continue on in the story, notice that um, Joash actually leads the way in his own, in his own revival. In chapter 24, verse 4, it says, Now it came about after this that Joash decided to restore the house of the Lord. And from verse 4 all the way down through uh, verse uh, 14, for the next 10 verses, it describes this re revival uh, in, in one sense of an external variety. It's a revival of restoring the temple to its former state and establishing the, the tithe and the offerings given to the temple to fund uh, the temple ministry. And Joash is just singularly behind this. This is an incredible moment in Joash's life. If we didn't have the inspired commentary on Joash, you might think, man, this guy, is, he is serving the Lord. Notice in verse 5, he gathers the Levites and he says to them, let's go out and collect all the money collect the, the annual money, but the, in verse 5b, the Levites did not act quickly. They didn't do what the king said. So the king summons them. He summons Jehoiada and, and says, why have you not required the Levites to bring in from Judah and Jerusalem the levy fixed by Moses? And then verse 7 explains why he hasn't, because the sons of, wicked, of the wicked Athaliah had broken into the house of God and even used the holy things of the house of the Lord for the Baals. So they actually don't have a way of bringing in that money from the nation of Israel to, to fund God-fearing worship in the temple because the sons of Athaliah are pillaging and plundering and they would take all of the money. So that's why they were slow to go about in, in obeying the king in this decree. 
So then verses 8 to 14 describe how they do that. And they just set up a chest and it gets taken out every day. And they start, you know, it's kind of like the daily deposit. They start making sure that the money's under lock and key. And so they implement the means that they need to protect the gifts of Israel from getting pillaged and stolen by the sons of Athaliah, the wicked sons. All well and good. This looks like a high point in Joash's life. But this is nothing more than external for Joash. It's important that we realize fear of godly men can often produce religious externals that are not a sign of spiritual life. What's imp- impressive about this revival, if you will, and I'll put revival in quotes, because there's nothing in it about uh, his own heart, his own, you know, when, when Josiah led in a revival, it started with his own brokenness over the law of God being violated. His heart was broken because he'd sinned against the Lord. This is a revival of external variety. And I kind of wonder sometimes, what, what, if, what if Ahaziah was still alive? What would he think about his son? We don't know if Zibia was alive, his, his mom. She may have been alive at this point. She might have been watching her son thinking, oh, my, my little boy, he's grown up to fear the Lord. You know, Jehoiada led the charge, starting a national coup, putting his own life on the line in order to establish Yahweh worship back in Israel. That's an incredible legacy for Joash. And he follows him here in the externals. It's kind of interesting. Sometimes we, you know, as parents, we get scared or blindsided by the reaction of our own kids to truth. And sometimes I've, you know, I've, I've seen in certain children, their propensity and their tendency is, I really, really want mom and dad's approval. And where they flourish is getting mom and dad's approval. And then they grow up and they leave and they go pursue the world. And sometimes, sometimes the interpretation of that is, man, they were such good kids and then what happened? And the answer would be right here in Joash's life. Nothing actually changed. Nothing actually changed. The circumstances changed, so the manifestation of that idol looked a lot different when they're out of the home, but they are still gripped and enslaved to the selfishness of the idol of what do people think of me, and I want what I want in the form of man-pleasing. When the audience changes, the externals change. Joash, Jeho- sorry, um, Joash here. In his heyday, he's he's looking pretty, looking pretty good, externally. And that's why we get to this critical point in the chapter that we've already read, verses fifteen to nineteen, um, the death of Jehoiada. Externally, things radically change. Internally, nothing changes. The fear of godly men. You might fear, the person that we fear might be godly as opposed to ungodly, but the nature of the fear of man is the same as the nature of the fear of godly men. It is still inherently selfish. It's self-absorbed. It views others as a means to start a fan club, to get approval, to get a pat on the back. And so here, Joash, enslaved to getting what he wants from others, is still, after Jehoiada dies, enslaved to getting what he wants from others. Nothing changes. Notice in verse 20. Then the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest. Just pause and think about that relationship for a second. I mean, this is a virtual stepbrother. I mean, they had the same earthly father figure. I mean, as far as human relationships go, they should be tight. 
as far as the fact that Joash spent his entire life fearing Jehoiada, concerned about pleasing Jehoiada, you would think he would care an awful lot about Zechariah. But Jehoash has obviously let external idolatry back into the nation because he, internal idolatry is ruling in his own heart. And so Zechariah has the guts and the conviction to stand up and say something about it publicly. And so he stands up and speaks above all the people and, and says to them, Thus God has said, I mean, again, 24 verse 20. Why do you transgress the commandments of the Lord and do not prosper? Because you have forsaken the Lord, he has also forsaken you. Wow, that takes guts. No fair man there. He says that to the king in front of the entire nation, in front of, mark you, the nation that has compelled Joash to go back to external idolatry. What else could he do? He's ruled by internal idolatry. So, of course, he follows because he fears man. So they speak up. Okay, let's do it. So, verse 21, they conspired against him, and at the command of the king, they stoned him. Joash gave that command. I mean, this is his stepbrother. So, wave of his hand, Zechariah is dead. They stoned him to death in the court of the house of the Lord. By the way, just want to pause right there real quick on our Second Chronicles narrative and make a quick cross-reference. You remember the statement of Jesus after the seven woes? You remember he mentions the blood of um, Abel all the way to Zechariah? Look at this real quick for a second, Matthew 23. I was appreciating this again, and I, I couldn't help but, you know, give, give me one undisciplined moment here, because this is just so fascinating. I just found this so helpful. Uh, we'll get back to Second Chronicles real quick, but in Matthew 23... Jesus uh, gives the woes to the scribes and the Pharisees. And if you skip down to verse 34, he says, Matthew 23, verse 34, Therefore, behold, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, so that upon you may fall the guilt of of all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, and then it says the son of Berechiah, whom you, have, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. <clears throat> I was thinking about that, and I'm thinking, well, that's, that's an interesting, interesting phrase there. Um, and this, you know, people have, people have said, yeah, he's pointing out to, you know, all the martyrs of the Old Testament from A to Z. Well, that might work in English, but it doesn't work in Hebrew or, or Greek for that matter. But the point being, it is kind of an A to Z in the sense that Abel is in Genesis and Zechariah, who was killed between, in, the, in the temple, was killed in Second Chronicles, which is the last book of the Hebrew canon. So from beginning to end, all of the righteous martyrs, the, their blood's going to be on your hands, he says. But what's interesting is, is that phrase, the son of Berechiah, because the son of Berechiah belongs to the prophet, not this man who stood up in 2 Chronicles and spoke out against Joash. He is obviously the son of Jehoiada. But the prophet Zechariah, who wrote the, prophet, the, in the, the minor prophet, he's the son of Berechiah. And so I looked that up and I found that, you know what, one of the oldest copies we have of Matthew uh, actually doesn't have the son of Berechiah in the text and I, I looked at it, I looked at it, I pulled it up on the website just looking at the photographs of that old manuscript. And it's, it's written, it's a hand write, handwritten in the uh, margin, son of Berechiah. So somebody, you know, added that after the, after the manuscript was written. But I was thinking that was just sweet, thinking about the connection of all of those righteous people standing against the hostility of the world, fearing God, not men. Zechariah was one of them. And he died for it. Verse 22, so back to 2 Chronicles 24, verse 22. Thus, Joash the king did not remember the kindness which his father Jehoiada had shown him, but he murdered his son. And as he died, he said, may the Lord see and avenge. So Zechariah just entrusts himself to the Lord.
It's a tragic end to Zechariah's life, but he dies a hero. And Joash lives in failure. 23 to 27, in these verses, the chronicler records the death of Joash. And what's fascinating about his death is it's an actual fulfillment of Zechariah's dying words. He records that the army of the Arameans come up, and it's a small army. He even emphasizes that. Uh, the army comes with a small number of men. So this like, little ragtag group of, our, of soldiers come against Israel, and the Lord, uh, it says the Lord delivered a very great army into their hands because, the Lord, because they had forsaken the Lord, the God of their fathers. So thus they executed judgment on Joash. And, um, and they ended up uh, killing the king, and he died. He, he was not buried. Uh, I'm sorry, verse 25, the, the, there was a conspiracy against him. Uh, they murdered him, he dies, and they did not bury him in the city of David with the kings. Uh, but, um, so if they, if they view the guy as living faithfully, they would view, bury him with their forefathers. And so they did not view him as a faithful man. It was obvious that he was a man pleaser. And so that's the end of Joash's life. Fear of godly men cannot produce an enduring life that pleases the Lord. There's just too much between you and the grave to possibly live a life that pleases the Lord if you're governed by the fear of godly men. There's too much. The fear of godly men actually is worse than the fear of ungodly men because it actually feeds a lie and it creates a hypocrisy, it creates an external appearance of righteousness. Meanwhile, it keeps feeding an internal lie that says, I can get what I want out of life and still please the Lord. And that's why Jesus reserved his harshest rebukes to the Pharisees, who were wrapped up in external religion, but internal hypocrisy. Here's an example that I thought might be helpful. I've counseled through this Dozens of times, especially as a college pastor, I remember counseling uh, young men who were, you know, maybe asking me, hey, what about, what about pursuing a girl, or what about a particular girl, or how do I think about this, and what do I think about marriage, and how do I apply some of these principles in, in Scripture, and, and uh, give, me, give me direction, pastor. And as, I, as, I've, as I've done that over, over 15 years, what, we, what became interesting is that wherever a young man would be gripped by the fear of man, or in this case, fear of woman, it was crippling. It was crippling because that young man had the inability to do what he needed to do and be who he needed to be, regardless of what people thought of him. Suddenly, if, if the discussion is pursuing somebody of, where there's romantic interest involved, there's all sorts of approval to be had, approval to be gained, and approval to be won. And I've seen that produce many, 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 many snares. Fear of man sets a snare, but he who trusts the Lord will prosper. And so I've seen this where a young man will lose the battle to lead in a relationship because he's gripped by approval. He's gripped by the idol of what does she think of me? Will she approve? And suddenly... He won't tell that girl anything but what she wants to hear. He won't lead her anywhere that she might not want to go. He suddenly is no longer a benefit to her spiritually, but a threat. Because that kind of influence, the kind of influence that's tainted and poisoned with fear of man, will always draw followers to worship self. Always. And so think about your influence and think about your, the, the, the privileges we have here at GB, GBC. The influence you have by way of example, the influence you might have by way of um, authority um, to, to, to the men in the congregation, the, the, in, the, the influence you have in marriages and in families and in the ministries and the service of the church. This is massive. I just wanted to list out a few signs of what fear of godly men might look like. Number one, worry. Worry. 
It doesn't matter if you fear godly men or ungodly men. This one will be common. Worry. Anxiety. Anxious thoughts and worries will, will plague your heart. You're going to be worried about what somebody thought of you because of your performance, because of your service, because of your ministry. You're going to be worried about what they think of your words. Did you say it right? Were they impressed? Did you stumble over yourself? Did you say the right thing? Did they think highly of you? You might even find yourself difficult to speak freely at times because what's governing you is not the truth or a desire to be transparent, but a desire to impress. Another sign of fear of godly men would be bitterness. You might not think that, but I think you'll appreciate this if you think it through with me. If you are gripped by gaining the applause and the approval of man, what happens when you don't get it? You will always disappoint. It will always come to an end. The person might not ever think highly of you, or they might think highly of you, but the way that you want their approval to be manifested may never come. And when that happens, that disappointment is immediately a temptation to bitterness. Because you are still worshiping, and they are getting in your way. Because see, you're not actually worshiping that person, you're worshiping their approval, and when they won't give it, that is the threat to your idol. And so now your hostilities are going to go against them. Is it any wonder why Joash killed Zechariah. He was gripped by the exact same idol that characterized his relationship with Zechariah's father, and now he's gripped by that same idol, and so it causes him to kill Zechariah. Number one, worry. Number two, bitterness. Number three, partiality. Partiality. We heard this back from that, that verse I read in Deuteronomy, but partiality. Partiality is, is, a, is part of fearing man because partiality means that we treat people with different standards or show favoritism to certain people who have something by which we gain. It could be wealth. If we show difference of, of, of esteem or approval or uh, treatment to people who are wealthy than we do poor or to people who are poor different than the wealthy. It can go both ways. We could be partial either way, whichever one suits us, for whatever purposes or for whatever cultural reasons we have to favor poor versus rich or rich versus poor. It could be influence. It could be the way they make us feel when we hang out and over a cup of coffee. Man, that guy makes me laugh. He's so fun to be around. It could be influence, prominence, significance. Whatever it is that's tickled our fancy, if we are partial market, we are fearing their response. James 2 describes the fear of man-pleasing, uh, partiality, judging according to the face, or literally receiving someone according to their appearance. And he, he completely condemns that, of course. You remember in James 2 where he talks about showing favoritism to somebody who's wealthy over somebody who's poor. And he says, you wicked judges, haven't you made judgments amongst yourselves? You're basically writing your own law because you're busy with your own religion, namely worshiping yourself in the form of man-pleasing. And so you have to write your own standards. And that's just, uh, that's, th that's how man-pleasing produces partiality. Number four, disordered thinking. Disordered thinking. What do you mean by that? Here's what I mean by that. Look at James 3 for a second. James 3 helps us, and we're going to have to end with this, but um, James 3 helps us see the connection between our selfish ambition and disordered thinking. And here's what happens. I'll, I'll, I'm going to connect verses 14 and verse 16, and I'm going to connect that to our study here on man-pleasing, or fear of godly men. In verse 14, James says, If you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. Now, how would you be lying against the truth? Well, 
because he's talking about somebody who claims to have faith. He talks about that back in chapter 2, somebody who claims to have faith. Even more recently in verse 13, he says, Who's wise and understanding? Let him show his good behavior by his deeds done in gentleness. So the person who's wise and understanding is not the person who claims to be wise and understanding. It's the person who shows it. So in that context, he says, don't be... Don't lie against the truth. In other words, don't claim that you follow the truth if your heart is gripped by bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. That's arrogant to think that. Yep, I follow the truth. And then here's what's going on in the inner man. Verse 16, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. That's such a great verse. Such a great verse. I've, um, I, 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 I've used this verse a lot in my own thinking. Um, when I, I used to work, when I was a college student, I used to work at, um, uh, at Lake Powell. And uh, one summer, well, one summer I did. So one summer I was up on the docks and we would set out, um, you know, get, get the boats ready to, to leave, make sure they had all the equipment, make sure everything was, was set and ready to go. And, and so, you know, if, if, if ropes started to get too old, we'd have to throw new ropes on there. And so when we put a new rope on, you, you would, you'd cut it to the right length for the anchor. And then we had this, you know, little um, um, container of this, you know, some sort of um, plastic wet plastic product that is, you'd let, let it sit out and dry, but you, you'd dip the end of the rope in that plastic product and it just glued itself on so that the, the rope wouldn't become frayed. So inevitably, you see an old rope and it got cut or maybe the, the, the past plastic wore out and inevitably, you're going to see this nasty just rope going everywhere, every direction. It's just completely frayed, going in every direction. And that, that's the picture that's the picture we should have in our minds of a heart that is gripped by the fear of godly men. Our thinking in our life is going to be frayed. It's going to go in every direction. It's going to be frenetic. There's no stability. I've seen this in my own life. When I'm gripped by what people think of me, my life, it, it, there's, there goes stability. Proverbs 29:25. The fear of man sets a snare. It sets a trap. And your life becomes disordered and it goes in every direction because there's too many people to please. Too many objects to aim at. Too many gods to worship. And so, Joash's life really becomes a help to us to start to recognize this. Now, obviously, we've got to repent. If this is true of our heart, we've got to repent and put that off. I want to charge you, if you've seen any of this in your own heart, kill it. Put this to death. This week, look at where those things are manifesting themselves and say, Lord, I'm going to say no to everything that I've said yes to that was fueled by the fear of godly men. And just say, Lord, it has to go. It has to go. You must reign supreme in my heart. Because if you fear godly men, you cannot live a persevering life that pleases the Lord. Father, thank you so much for this uh, tragic but clear example from Joash. And so, Lord, as we think about the danger of fearing godly men, thank you for protecting us by exposing us and bringing conviction. And I pray that you would bring us correction from your word so that we would kill all of those idols and that we would be perfectly content, Lord to simply please you internally and externally, to be comfortable as so long as we please you, to, be, to have no regard for what people think of us. And so, Lord, there's, there's no doubt opportunities for that this week. There no doubt will be a very telling opportunities for us to um, crucify that very sin this week. No doubt, Lord, you'll bring opportunity that will face, force us to choose between loyalty to you and man-pleasing. And I pray that at that very moment, Lord, we would recognize by faith this is a gift from you so that we can put this to death. And Lord, we, we want to covenant with you, not because we can make covenants and be faithful to them, but because we uh, can pray to you in such a way that we are uh, committed to relying on your grace, knowing that we can't do this on our own. We want a covenant to be those who fear you and you alone. So continue to help us, Lord. Thank you for being so gracious to us, for being so patient with us uh, as we see uh, man-fearing. Help us to kill it. In your name we pray. Amen.